From the Auto Line Studios, here is your host, John McElroy. Thanks for joining us on Auto Line this week. You know, you've heard of all kinds of talk about fuel economy regulations for cars and light trucks. What about heavy trucks? It's really starting to step up. The Obama administration just passed phase two, which is going to have a 36% reduction in fuel consumption by heavy trucks by the year 2027. But but how's the industry going to do that? What kind of technology and components and can trucking industries even afford to all this technology? We're getting into that today because I've got three experts on the field. Mihai Durabantu is the Director of Technology, Planning and Government Affairs at the Eaton Corporation. Tom Manganella is with the law firm Warner Norcross and Judd, where he's the chair of their automotive industry group. And Brian Pohl is the president of Pohl Transportation, a trucking industry itself. And thank you all for joining us on AutoLine this week. Thank you, John. Thank you. Thank you. Brian, we're seeing all kinds of technology coming into cars to significantly boost their fuel economy. Sure. Phase one, we've sort of run through that. As I just indicated, the Obama administration is now proposing phase two. My question to you is, how's it look from somebody's vantage point that has to buy all this technology? Can you afford it? At this point, um, no, because we don't know what it's going to cost. Um, the estimates are anywhere from ten to $30,000. Per truck? Per truck. That's a lot of money per truck, and just to on, add to it. Sure, and that's on projections out to 2027, when I mean, the lot can happen between now and then. And a lot of the technology is unproven at this point. Um, Miha can probably talk better about the heat reduction or the heat uh, capture to improve the fuel economy. But that's an unknown uh, technology at this point, if it's going to work. Um, is it applicable, applicable to long-haul trucking? Is it going to do to work over time? Does it have the durability? So there's just a lot of questions going on that we don't have the answers to. Now, phase one increased the price of the engines alone significantly. I want to say it was something like $6,000 per engine. About 12 it costed us. Oh, 12 is what it actually ended up. Now, were you able to make that back in fuel economy savings? No. Ooh, Unfortunately, our customers had to absorb some of it. And we have a, a good customer base that understood what was going on. They, ke they keep up with the industry. They, they realized that the, the cost of... Um, Chucking itself had increased, so they were willing to, to contribute some higher rates to alleviate some of the pain that we were feeling. So, Mihai, at the Eaton Corporation, how are you looking at all this? Well, um, we have been in the business, and, and probably a lot of our competitors and uh, um, our, our, certainly our customers uh, have been in the business of trying to drive fuel efficiency for, for quite a while. Uh, in the past, it's been the cost of fuel that has been a driver. It continues to be. Even the, today, the cost of diesel might be lower than it was uh, many years ago, even when uh, phase one uh, w went into effect. Uh, but we do know that, that, that fuel is a, um, a high cost. So efficiency, fuel efficiency has always been uh, important. And I think the industry is responding with a number of technologies. Automation is by far... Uh, an, an important um, uh, technology in terms of saving fuel, although it started really as a driver comfort or driver's uh, safety uh, type of uh, technology. But now coupled with what's happening on the engine side where uh, you have more efficient combustion but also running the engine at much lower speed, automation now becomes the natural um, technology solution for um, high efficient um, uh, trucks. There, there, there is a lot happening and some technologies are proven, some technologies are in the market today, and uh, some technologies uh, are uh, more futuristic. Uh, uh, as you said, Brian, uh, waste heat recovery has still to um, uh, show its promise in, in, in the market and then become a reliable technology so that uh, it actually delivers the goods without uh, stranding uh, the trucks uh, on the side of the road. But overall, uh, we're optimistic. We we are feeling this regulation as a driving force in, uh, in, in the um, uh, supplier um, community and the OEM community uh, that maintains this focus on fuel economy. And you know, our industry has been on a forced march for about 15, 20 years in terms of emissions and reduced emissions that added a lot of costs and a lot of reliability issues. Uh, and lowered fuel economy. Yes, and, and in fact did lower the fuel economy. I do feel that we are on the cusp of something different now, where at least in principle, the technology goals, the regulatory goals, 
and the industry goals of taking cost out and uh, uh, saving the, the cost fuel are at least uh, aligned. How they play out? Well, it remains to be seen. Uh, you, you can uh, th think that 2021, when these uh, new regulations just around the corner, um, uh, as manufacturers, that's exactly how we feel, that we don't have enough time uh, to, to get our technology there. But on the other hand, there, all these companies do have things in their technology stables that are uh, ready to, uh, to be put out and to mature uh, in, in the field and, and show their value. Tom, how do you see it? Well, I'm not going to comment on w w the operators or the, or the technology, but I think... Uh, as the need for this increases more and more, we're going to have to have um, driver education and we're going to have to have commonization of state legislation. Because right now, if you're running a truck from Michigan to Florida, um, uh, just on I-75, you're going to run into six different laws uh, regarding um, uh, the distance between trucks. And if, and if the goal, if one of the goals, for instance, is to move to platooning, where you, where you run several trucks in a row, um, some experts have told me that they can run them at 75 miles an hour, three feet apart. Uh, with, so you're talking about a whole new technology coming in where you can el electronically it's not new tether technology. trucks together. It's right here and it's right now. And what happens is, uh, think of a Bluetooth, uh, if you have a Bluetooth system in your house, uh, where your phone controls your stereo. Um, this is Bluetooth technology where the lead truck, the, the Bluetooth signal from the lead truck will be transmitted to every single truck in the platoon. So everybody accelerates at once, everybody brakes at once, everybody keeps exactly the same speed. And the vehicles using what's in cars right now, this distance sensing technology, keeps those vehicles three feet apart. So basically what you have is a freight train only instead of on rails, they're on wheels. Um, but right now, the distances that are allowable between truck, you know, from truck to truck varies anywhere from some states that have no statute, some states that have statutes that say you have to allow a car to pass and get in between two trucks. Some states have 150 feet, 250. One state goes up to 500 feet. You can't have two trucks within 500 feet. That's all got to be changed. They, okay, but what's the advantage of this platooning from a fuel economy standpoint? Depends on who you, what the research is, but it's anywhere from 10% for the trucks in the middle to 5% for the lead truck. So over a, over a you know, 2,000 mile trip, that's a lot of fuel savings for a platoon of you know, 7 to 10 trucks. But you've got to, now you've got to educate people because if that platoon's going down the road at 2 a.m. With, with maybe you know, theoretically two, two awake drivers, the driver in the lead and the driver in the tail, and all the drivers in the middle are, you know. They're asleep. They're asleep. Um, if, if some guy is driving down the road in the left lane at 66 miles an hour and those trucks are coming down in the same lane at 75, they've got to learn how to pull over. I mean, you've been to Europe a lot, John, I know. Just think of the way people drive on the Autobahn as compared to the way people drive on I-75. You know, somebody will get in the left lane on I-75 and they'll go 65 miles an hour and people will end up passing them on the right. No more of that. So I think we need to have driver education. We need to have law enforcement enforcement of what it means to be in a passing lane, what it means to be in the center lane, what it means to drive in the right lane. Um, Tom, I say lots of luck on that one. I, I know. was taught that in driver's ed, and that was many moons ago. When, when was people still haven't uh, learned how to do it. When right. was the last time a law enforcement officer tried to enforce it? I think we're going to have to move in that direction. We're education okay. and enforcement. Yeah, that might start to move it. But, uh, Brian, what do you think? Platooning, is that uh, po I mean, you're the guy that's, whose trucks presumably would be all platooned. Does this make sense to you for, from a fuel economy standpoint? From a fuel economy standpoint, any time we can get a 10 percent to five percent improvement we're more than happy my fear as a um, trucking company owner is the safety factor it's going to take one accident of a vehicle a car getting in front of that lead truck and causing the rest of them to just cascade and have a huge horrendous accident once that occurs I think the whole idea of platooning unfortunately will be put to the side because it's going to be the pictures that go to the media that the general public sees that's going to put a backlash 
and people's minds about having a larger group of trucks going down the road. But today we already have adaptive cruise control and uh, presumably the technology would be able to adapt to that. Um, possibly. The, the technology that they're talking about is not the same that the radar technology which we use for adaptive cruise control. It's based on a V to V, vehicle to vehicle technology. It's um, uh, communications via, via the, the wireless of 5.9 gigahertz as opposed to the radar that we currently use. So it is a different technology, even though it's currently being used. Um, the technology is there. It's just the safety factor and the public image, which I think will prevent the plut plutonium from occurring. I, I think mm -hmm. the reality is that we'll see a battery of technologies. So we will see platooning when platooning is uh, make makes sense which is really long haul type of um, uh, applications uh, w with perhaps many trucks going from the same place to the same de uh, destination. But we will see other uh, technologies uh, in, in play. We will see the diesel engine becoming more efficient. We will see powertrain uh, taking up not just automation but actually making sure that the engine is sitting in its, uh, truly in its uh, sweet spot and, and so forth. We'll see electrification uh, on, on the trucks. Uh, we will see some lesser degrees of automation uh, that do add value in the sense that, that relieve drivers of uh, either stress or allow them to do the low speed maneuvering uh, uh, faster and, um, and better and, uh, and, and safer. Now, of course, all these technologies um, they all add up to the cost. So, so how these technologies can be made in a, in a cost-effective fashion, in a reliable fashion, that is a, um, a, a big question. And I don't know that we have the answers yet, but I think that's where, uh, where the uh, in industry uh, is. But moreover, so. Mihai, now we see diesel prices far cheaper than they were just a few years ago. In fact, in many places in the country, diesel fuel, amazingly, is now cheaper than gasoline. How does that impact how trucking, and I'll, we'll get to Brian's input on this yet, but I wanted to yeah. hear what you've got to say <laughs> is, uh, yeah. uh, how do you get a payback mm -hmm. when you put all this new technology in, figuring that high cost of fuel would be uh, the thing that would help pay for this? I, natural I think, gas had that. Yeah. 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 I mean, well, you don't hear I, anything I, about natural gas anymore. No. I mean, it used to be the talk two to three years ago, and you know, I saw one company that touted it in the past, uh, a few of their trucks on the road today, which I hadn't seen in ages. Mm -hmm. um, so that's one, one fear that a trucking company has is that a technology isn't going to be a fed or a um, non-long-term solution to a major problem, which is you know, fuel efficiency, um, driving the trucks, um, replacing diesel technology, which has been around for over 100 years and is established with the natural gas technology, which is unproven in a lot of instances, adds a lot of weight, mm -hmm. and it's mainly for short-haul um, carriers. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So. I think the, um, the price of diesel, price of oil, uh, we know that these fluctuate. And uh, it is unfortunate that when the price of uh, oil, for whatever reason, is high, we see a lot of focus on, on fuel economy. And then, and then in, in the past car industry, in the light duty industry, um, I think our attention spans about two, three months uh, old. And, 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 and then the price goes down, and, and uh, uh, buyer's habits uh, change uh, significantly, and then they change uh, again. So one way to look at these regulations is that they do provide a constant forcing function, if you wish, to maintain that focus on, uh, on fuel economy. Now, from a political perspective, the focus is really CO2 emissions, which have nothing to do uh, with the price uh, of, um, uh, of fuel. But from commercial perspective, from the cost of transportation, uh, one, I would say, beneficial effect of the regulation is that it maintains the industry's focus on reducing, uh, reducing fuel, so that when fuel costs do go up, then the technology uh, it, it is there, as opposed to turning on and off the innovation machine based on the fluctuations of, uh, of fuel prices. Mm -hmm. Tom, uh, you, you seem to be mostly focused on autonomy here as, mm -hmm. as the way to get this fuel efficiency. You talked about platooning, but in fact, if we can, as a country, attack the transportation system as a system, there's probably more gains to be made than trying to improve each individual truck on the road. Uh, where, you've talked about platooning. Where do you see the whole issue of autonomy going for trucks? Um, I, I think that it's, I think that truck autonomy and, tr and commercial truck autonomy 
will probably uh, become more readily acceptable and, and actually lead the industry as opposed to passenger car because there's fewer, it, it, they're bigger, of course, they use more fuel. Um, manpower, is, as I understand it, is, is uh, a big concern right now, getting drivers, uh, um, uh, qualified people. And it's, it's somewhat of a m more controlled industry than just you know, John Doe who goes out and buys a vehicle. Um, so I, I and, and I've consulted with some states around the country, uh, the departments of transportation, and they are really focused on, uh, some states are really focused on, on um, commercial transportation, whether it's truck platooning for cargo, um, autonomous or automated vehicle usage for moving large groups of people. I'm thinking of some of the states that are really focused on, on um, tourism. Um, I think uh, commercial applications are going to be readily uh, uh, available in the not too distant future for, for that portion of the population that is um, uh, either can't drive because of age or infirmity or, uh, or can't afford private transportation. And so I, I really think as the urbanization takes place, and that's one of the megatrends, there's five megatrends, urbanization is, is clearly one of the top ones. We're gonna see more and more need for autonomous vehicles, which is gonna you know, impact legislation, it's gonna impact driver's education, it's gonna definitely impact um, product liability, which I did, uh, I was a product liability lawyer for 24 years. Um, it's going gonna, it's gonna to really be a game changer in those areas. Brian, uh, Tom raises a really good point here. Getting drivers. Mm -hmm. uh, everywhere I turn to, I hear it's a real issue. In fact, it's an issue in the rest of the auto industry trying to get talent, but I understand in the trucking industry that's a real issue. Couldn't autonomy help in that regard? I think it'll hurt it. How so? Um, in my view, I don't think we'll ever have what's called level four fully autonomous trucks. Um, the reasons being the general public won't stand for it. Um, I think a, a number was out of two-thirds of the driving public doesn't want driverless trucks. Um, you got to think about it. There's 3.4 million truck drivers in America. Um, what's going to happen to those when those jobs are eliminated? What are they going to do at that point? Um, so I think there's going to be a big fight from the drivers themselves, the associations involved with the, the drivers, like OIDA, the owner operators, mm -hmm. uh, independent driver association, and the unions are going to fight it, I believe. Um, you also have some of the OEMs. Freightliner said it will not produce a level four truck, fully autonomous truck. It's already stated that already. And then finally, you have the safety, ad safety advocates that I think will be very, very much against autonomous trucks. Um, and as far as driver recruitment, if you have level three trucks, um, why would I, as a truck owner, pay $30,000 for a semi-autonomous truck that can drive at times down the road without the driver having control but then still pay for a driver to be in the truck. Where am I going to get the return on investment? In addition, the semi-autonomous trucks reduce driver fatigue and they increase safety, but the two biggest driver complaints are that they don't get paid enough and they don't get home enough. So the semi-autonomous trucks don't correlate to the needs that the drivers are having right now. And also I think that um, if I was a uh, you know, young man trying to find a job for the rest of my life, why would I enter the trucking industry to be a driver when there's this, this specter or a possibility that trucks would go fully autonomous? Who's going to enter an, in an industry that may go obsolete? Mm -hmm. Why would I want to do that? It'd be like somebody, uh, I don't know, a harness maker back when you know, people were using horses when they, the cars were coming around. Mm -hmm. it, it's going to go out of style. It's not going to be um, possible for somebody to keep that forever. If That's the perception now. I'm not saying it's going to happen. I don't right. think it's going to happen. Yeah. So I think it's... it's not. actually bad for the trucking industry in terms of driver recruitment. Mm -hmm. yeah, very interesting. interesting. I, yeah. I think on top of that, you also have to look at one of the effects of the uh, greenhouse gas uh, regulations is that it will focus industry investment along fuel efficient technologies in a relatively conventional um, uh, architecture. Mm -hmm. um, and frankly speaking, there are limited R&D resources. And uh, I think what's going to happen with phase two and with similar uh, legislation coming up in Europe, for that matter, uh, it will just drive most of the investment into the things like the uh, truck aerodynamics, the engine efficiency, the powertrain efficiency, electrification, and, 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 and so forth. And 
that by implication means there will be less resources against uh, some of these more perhaps game-changing technologies, but they also have high adoption risks and, and limitations. Very interesting. Tom, what do you make of it? I mean, uh, well, I, 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 I agree with the focus on the energy saving. The, the, I don't want to call it the low-hanging fruit because I understand it's very t complicated. But I really think that the technology that the trucks are going to use eventually is already going to be developed, and it's going to be developed and used in passenger cars. That, I think, is, is going to be coming down the road, no pun intended, a lot, a lot faster than most people in the general population think. And I think it's, it's not going to be a major leap to take that technology and, and use it on, on commercial vehicles instead of passenger vehicles or light trucks. And I also think that um, the adoption rate, I, I, public perception, to, to address your concern, is one thing right now. But with education and when the safety advocates in particular realize that these trucks are eventually going to be safer, um, much safer, than a, than a truck driver driving you know, for eight hours um, with, with potentially, you know, Bad dietary, or you know, there was a there was just an article in the paper about a driver that drove eight hours to get to his job so that he could then drive ten hours, and he resulted in, in an accident, um, injuring a very famous comedian. Um, I, th th I think the safety is going to go up, and I think the acceptance rate is going to be um, accelerated a lot faster than people think. So. I, I would agree with Tom only because uh, in, in this regard. Uh, the public hasn't seen any autonomous cars. And conceptually, they're against it because they haven't seen it. But I've seen a conversion, if you will, take place in a matter of minutes when people are exposed to autonomous cars. I don't know about autonomous trucks. That's, that's a whole different scale. <laughs> but nonetheless, when they experience some of these autonomous cars that are from the R&D departments, they're not in the showrooms right now. But nonetheless, and, and my wife being one in particular, who just after a few minutes of experiencing, hey, it uh, automatically slows up, speeds down, or uh, speeds up, slows down, makes turns safely, and all that. I mean, it, it takes very little time for people to become much more com comfortable with the concept than just hearing about it. Sure, but you also have to think um, the trucking industry has a major problem right now, right now, in terms of image. Um, the general public um, thinks negatively of trucks. Um, they see them as the, these large vehicles going down the road. The one advantage we have at this point is we can personalize the vehicles somewhat because there's a driver in them. Um, the Truckload Carrier Association has a, a very effective um, image campaign going on right now where they're, they're, they're putting trailer wraps on the trailers showing a child and saying, my mother or my father drives this truck. Mm. So the minute you take out the driver, it depersonalizes that vehicle, creates it into um, a class eight Christine from the Stephen King novel, but when I think of it that way, barreling down the road. And at that point, the, the general public, I think, is even going to have a worse attitude because it, it takes away that human factor involved with the vehicles at this point. Yeah, but I, I would think that we're not going to see these trucks, even if they do come about, for another decade or, or more probably. And we'll certainly see a lot more autonomy on the part of passenger cars in that time. Sure. But, uh, Mihai, let's go back to you. As this autonomy comes along, and, and there are some clear advantages with it, does a company like Eaton have to rethink some of its product portfolio or, or rethink how they get designed to fit in with this technology? Of course, um, and that is part of what technology planning is within uh, our company as well as uh, within uh, our peers. Uh, but people are talking about intelligent and connected trucks. And I think that is an intermediate step that is much more digestible. Uh, and, and in fact, it does produce um, um, benefit to the transportation industry uh, right away. So uh, autonomy perhaps you know, at 75 miles an hour uh, down, down the freeway might be a uh, way out. But autonomy in terms of self-parking, backing into the dock, uh, being able to execute uh, steer-by-wire type of maneuvers and automate those, I think that that's much closer and has immediate benefit. Uh, it actually helps the driver. It actually helps the transportation industry. It protects uh, the, the, the vehicles. So. All major companies invest significant amount of resources in, in this topic of intelligent trucks. 
Uh, I think um, uh, platooning is probably on the outer edge uh, of, of uh, that approach. Uh, but Eden and, and our peers, our competitors, uh, we are all investing, uh, as I mentioned, uh, significantly into understanding which features need what and how do we go with deep integration of the information that already exists or is in, uh, in and around the truck environment. So, for example, Brian, you, there are radars today and they're really used for, uh, for measuring uh, distance to, um, uh, for, for collision warning. Mm -hmm. But the information in that radar can also be used, packaged differently and transmitted differently, can be used to um, help the powertrain make more smooth um, uh, shifting decisions and engine torque decisions mm -hmm. that in the end save fuel. So I think that it's this degree of automation and intelligence and deep integration uh, of the powertrain and the entire vehicle that we're going to see first. We've already seen it. Um, and, um, and, and as these evolves and as the technology evolves and as we understand the implications inside the truck of a heavily integrated and full of sensor truck, uh, I, th I think then we'll be ready to, to tackle the uh, next challenges. And, and, and with that point, we're going to have to wrap this show up. Uh, you know, There's a great discussion here. But Mihai Dorobantu from Eaton, Tom Manganello from Warner, Warner Norcross, and Brian Pohl from Pohl Transportation. Thank you all so much. Thank, Thank you. you.